Welcome to The Chase Hudson Show, a podcast dedicated to inspiring you to become extraordinary. Each week, we sit down with top-tier business owners, real estate investors, and influencers to inspire you to build your legacy. It's time to level up. Hey guys, welcome to another episode of The Chase Hudson Show. Today, we sit down with Mitch Casey, a serial entrepreneur and the current co-founder and co-CEO of Dime Beauty Company. We had his partner, Ryan Ralph, in a couple of weeks ago, and it's, it's, it's such a great episode to sit down with Mitch and to talk about the early days of Dime, the ultimate sale of the business, and what's coming next for them. Uh, he gives some incredible insight. It's an awesome story for anyone who's, who's interested in starting their own business. Um, so, so looking forward to jumping in here, guys. And with that said, let's, let's do it. All right. Well, welcome to another episode of the Chase Hudson Show today in the studio. We have a real treat with us, Mitch Casey. I'm Thank excited you. for this. Excited to be here. Um, before we jump in, I'll give a little bio on Mitch. So Mitch Casey is a serial entrepreneur and the co-founder and co-CEO of Dying Beauty Company, a skincare, wellness, and beauty brand based in Draper, Utah. In addition to Dying Beauty, he's also founded Simple Manufacturing, Simple Ventures, Black Hat Capital, and several other businesses earlier in his career. Mitch recently closed on a massive partial sale of Dime Beauty and is continuing to grow his investment portfolio. So we had your your partner in here a few weeks ago, Ryan Ralph, and I'm excited to, to jump in on, on your side of the story, dude. Yeah, absolutely. Should be fun. Excited so to be here. Um, one of the first things I usually, I usually ask, and this is a little unique because I knew you in high school, but I, I, w- I would like to understand and help help listeners understand, you know, your upbringing a little bit. Like, you guys have been extremely successful with Dime, and I know you've been a serial entrepreneur. You've started multiple businesses. Mm-hmm. So help us understand your childhood. Like, where did that drive come from? Where did, yeah, where did that desire come from? How did how'd that get molded? Yeah, so my entire life, my dad has basically owned businesses. Okay. So he started out in walmart actually he managed a walmart in price utah before Mm. i was born and so he did that and he recognized he just didn't like the retail space having to work weekends and nights and so he eventually shifted to packaging and kind of the wellness skincare space and the reason being is because his dad sold packaging for a company okay and they got acquired by mccormick the spice company yeah and so he kind of was around that Mm. and his parents actually got divorced and so he moved to california his dad stayed in the new jersey area and he went and he got his schooling at byu and he was pretty much in sales and that's when he kind of went to walmart and then he went to idaho state and got his masters there yeah. working at a potato company nice classic just hoofing you know big bags of potatoes <laughs> yeah. but then he uh went and worked for a packaging company up in seattle okay so spent a little time up there and then he got poached by new skin mm. and so him and his twin brother both went to new skin and they were packaging engineers you know whatever that right. entails you know mm-hmm. corporate likes to give titles to everybody mm-hmm. so they would just oversee all things packaging making sure it's in spec and work with the suppliers and things like that and then his brother kevin actually went and started a packaging distribution company because he saw a need for it here in utah and essentially yeah. they would order millions or hundreds of thousands of units of bottles, tubes, any kind of packaging that you use with skincare wellness products. Mm. And then the customers would just pull a batch amount of it. So like 10,000, 25,000. So their cash flow wasn't tied up in millions of units. Got it. So that was the yeah. service they provided was they would order bulk, warehouse it for the customer, and then it would allow them to keep cash flow tight, but also lower lead times. Mm. Interesting. And so my dad was working at New Skin and my uncle kevin started that and it was doing well and my dad had some challenges with new skin so he essentially came over and just came on as a sales guy for my uncle yeah and at the time they also saw a need to start a contract manufacturer Mm. company that actually ordered the raws batched it and made the bulk itself for companies like a new skin okay so he started that and his deal with my dad was my dad would run the packaging distribution company which is called case pack and then my uncle was running Wasatch product development. Okay. So they did that 25 years ago. Wow. And essentially my dad came on and over time he bought his way into Case Pack. Got it. He rolled over his commissions and things that he was making and 
got equity into case pack and so it got to the point where case pack was getting of significant size but then a group called usana came on and wanted to buy wasatch product development mm. so they bought it for like five million dollars okay and at the time my dad had a small slice of equity in that okay. just because of the sweat equity he was earning sure so then that that took my uncle over and he worked for usana for a handful of years when my dad was still running case pack mm -hmm. and just slowly my dad was buying back into case pack and he became a 50 50 partner eventually okay with your uncle yeah okay and then <laughs> USANA was like, we don't really like this gig. This is more complicated than we thought. So then my dad and Kevin bought Wasatch product development back oh, wow. for like 2 million. Okay, nice. So they that's got a deal, deal on it, <laughs> yeah. brought it back in. Yeah. And essentially that's what they did for the next 20 years. So I was just around that. Got it. And, you know, I can look back at my elementary years and my dad would bring home boxes of dip tubes. So like sprayers that have the tube at the end, uh -huh. he'd bring it back and we'd be cutting it at night while watching American Idol. Yeah. And so I just grew up around that and then always would go there after school and go do some piecework type stuff. And so mm -hmm. got my feet wet in that space, the supply chain operations of kind of the skincare wellness industry. Got it. But having seen my dad do that, I don't know. I just always was entrepreneurial, right? Lemonade stands. And then Wasatch, I did like a makeshift vending machine. It was an actual vending machine, but it was just boxes of candy back mm -hmm. when people were a little more trustworthy. And I would go sure. to Costco, buy the bulk of candy bars, and then sell it for two, three bucks a pop. And generated some cash that way and paid for truck gas and yeah. the truck itself and yeah. the play money, right? Taking girls on dates and things. Yeah, of course. You got and to. so... Just kind of got that bug and then did like a t-shirt brand in um, in high school. I'm sure you remember yeah, that. Yeah, Notion Threads. And Vital. Vital. Oh, so we did Vital me. in high school. That's right. That was the first one. And funny enough, Ryan was actually our first customer. Really? So we were just slinging <laughs> t-shirts at high school. And it was just fun to kind of get that background experience of like having to order bulk yeah. and then selling it, playing with pricing and how that looked. Yeah. And then as most things do, it kind of tapered off and failed. Uh-huh. And then from there, went on a church mission, did that for two years, came back, and then started another apparel brand called Notion, Notion. Threads. Notion, that was, okay. Well, you're at BYU, yeah. right, early days, yeah. yeah. Yep, so got into that, same thing, trying to do t-shirts, hats. It was kind of the aspiration was to be a Nike, mm -hmm. athleisure, kind of those brands, the lifestyle that was super cool. Yeah. But quickly learned that apparel is not the move. The margins really? are tough. Okay. You got to deal with ample SKUs because you got sizes, you got colors, and anybody can go start an apparel brand with $500, right? Yeah, yeah. So it was tough lessons, but learned mm -hmm. like, okay, what do we do? We keep accounting, we got to keep track of inventory costs, we got to keep track of cash flow, because that was a big thing that I don't think many people realize what yeah. a game cash flow is. Of course. And did that for like a year, year and a half, and, didn't go great. Had some challenges with partners mm -hmm. and just decided to give up on this it. This is Notion yeah. you're still talking about. Yeah. So, yeah. okay. So you started, you started Notion after your mission, right? Yes. What year was that? Was that like? That would have been 2014. 2014. And was yeah. it, it was you and a couple business partners? It was me, Braxton Davies okay. and two other guys that okay. we met through, uh, individual I had trained on my mission. Got it. Okay. So you're getting that off the ground and, and what was the biggest struggle that led to kind of you guys throwing the, the towel? I would say towel. the partnership. Okay. Yeah. Going into it, I think the expectations we all had of like who would do what yeah. wasn't clearly set. And so it led to frustrations of people feeling like they are carrying more than others mm. and there's certain equity percentages. Didn't align. With yeah. That. And so, I, you know, that was the yeah. first lesson in business I learned was you got to make sure you know who you're going into business with. Mm -hmm. And a few other things occurred down the road that I'm, we'll get into, but sure. didn't learn it the first time. It's taken a few tough lessons to yeah. learn. Like who you go into business with is a huge deal. It's a, it's a marriage, right? Yeah. Yep. And you talk to them more than you, you do your actual spouse. It's true. And <laughs> it's true. so that was a huge lesson learned on that one. Yeah. Got it. Okay. So, so w at what point did you guys say, hey, we're going to call this one quits? And It was about a year, year and a half in okay. going to school. And school was grind. As you know, you went to BYU as well. It was yep. really tough. And so that coupled with trying to do this business, it was just like yeah, being spread too thin and not knowing yeah. what we were doing. So yeah. we decided yeah. to just kind of close shop. Okay. That makes sense. All yeah. right. So then 
you're at you come back from your mission you're at BYU yeah help us help us go from you start BYU and and your journey through through college and then graduation and you started another business after no, after notion or yeah so Dulo Supply Co dude, so oh, that's right dude <laughs> Dulo, a lot Dulo if we look back at the LLCs have they been associated lot. with my name we're in the mid twenties for sure <laughs> we did a quick search on on that yeah I'm sure okay so tell us about Dulo so yeah going to school went to uh, BYU and got into the marketing program there. Okay. And the reason I went with marketing, I thought I wanted to be an entrepreneur, but I went with marketing because I was hoping I'd get a little more hard skill set. Mm-hmm. Cause I felt the entrepreneurship program was not really giving me much to okay. work with. Sure. So my dad's a big, you know, proponent of, of college mm-hmm. and having gone to college was, I think the biggest gain out of it was the network that you built and the people you met. Yeah. You know, candidly, a lot of the things I learned, in school I don't use today but went through and while I was doing that just the itch man just wanting to do something so I started another thing by myself called Dulo Supply Co and it was it was the same thing as lifestyle apparel but the focus on this was x percent of sales would go back to supporting like mental health initiatives and institutions because that's something that's pretty adamant in my family and something that I've dealt with myself so that was kind of the unique angle I was going yeah, for there. And the approach on that was it was a little more outdo- outdoor focused, whereas Notion was kind of like a, a Ruka, if you're familiar with that mm-hmm. brand, kind of focused around skate and kind of the extreme sports, whereas Dula was more about kind of outdoors. Okay. And, so that was a place for me, like when I struggle with my mental situations, being outdoors, nice. camping, you know, dirt biking, things like that was a nice escape. And so that was kind yeah. of the correlation there. Cool. So... The first skew I launched was a wallet and did that on Kickstarter and Indiegogo. And it actually went pretty well. I don't remember the amount. I think it was like 20,000 we raised nice. and it was like 500,000 wallets. So I thought I'd made it right. I was yeah. like, dang, I finally have something that found success. Yeah. And so that's when I actually reached out to Ryan because okay. I, we hadn't been in touch at all since high school. So going back to high school, yeah, we knew of each other, right? I played football and basketball. I played baseball mm-hmm. with yourself. And so yeah. it was a different crowd. You, yeah, you knew of sure. each other, but didn't yeah, hang yeah. out a lot. Yeah. So I saw on LinkedIn that he worked at a 3PL logistics company that would ship out orders for e-commerce companies. Mm-hmm. And I had been doing orders here and there with Notion out of a bedroom in our house with my wife taken to the USPS office, handwriting labels. Mm. It was just not ideal. And so I was like, all right, I have five to 500 to a thousand orders. I want to actually do this in an efficient manner. So yeah. I reached out to Ryan Got it. and he was working at these, the three PL and he was like, yeah, man, I'll help you for sure. It was just a cold message on LinkedIn. Mm-hmm. We hadn't talked for, I don't know, five years probably. Yeah. And he's like, yeah, I'd be happy to help you out. So we just scheduled the time to go and sh- kind of send out those orders. But, Unbeknownst to me, he had actually been cold emailing my dad trying to win freight business at Case Pack. Oh, okay. And so my dad, he never actually won any of the business, but my dad just really liked, you know, his approach and the mentality he had as he was cold emailing him. Yeah, I got it. And so I told him I was going to send out these orders and he's like, hey, he's been talking to me. I really like his approach. You should see if he'd be interested in another opportunity Mm because I was about to graduate college in 2017 and we just had our first little girl Mm. and so i was coming to kind of realization of like all right i gotta get a job Mm -hmm. and get health insurance yeah so i was gonna come on and do sales for my dad at case pack the packaging company Mm -hmm. while just on the side doing dulo still got it and so we started putting together orders we just caught up and i asked him as i came and i was curious if you know you'd want to come do sales at case pack and he Mm -hmm. said yeah if the price is right i would explore it for sure Mm -hmm. So they kind of went back and forth. And the reason he was bringing on sales guys is because all the sales guys at his company were kind of on the out. They were older, looking to retire in a handful of years. So he accepted and we both came on and we're doing sales at Case Pack. Mm. And we literally sat back to back at lifetime tables in my dad's office Mm because they didn't have the space. And so we started learning the back end of packaging and selling packaging and working with customers in that space. And while we were doing that, we both had a side hustle. I was doing Dulo Mm -hmm. and he was doing a product development company. So he's a big product guy. Mm -hmm. I also enjoy product, but I would say I'm more marketing focused. Sure. And so we recognized this and we're like, you know what, let's just do this together. It makes sense to do it together instead of separately. And fortunate enough, like we didn't really vet each other out much, but fortunate enough that partnership (laughs) panned out versus some others we got into. That's good. 
Um, so yeah, that's kind of through college how things ran up into Ryan and I connecting and being okay. together there at Case. So so what happened to to Dulo? I mean, you you met Ryan. You guys just figured out that you had some synergies and you wanted to to ultimately start Dime. What ended up happening to Dulo? Did that fizzle out or mm-hmm. did it go away? Yeah, so I was still doing it on the side. I had done a few other Kickstarters that actually went pretty well. Um, I did a backpack, and I think I raised like 50000 60000 on it. Nice. But it was just really tough trying to do that, plus the sales gig. And then Ryan and I had started some things together. So we'd done our first business we started was a dropship baby clothes company, mm-hmm. right? And if people remember the dropship model, it was set up a Shopify account, you connect it with a source that would connect you with all these suppliers in China, mm-hmm. and you wouldn't have to buy any inventory. A customer would order it, and then it would be shipped directly from China to the end consumer. Got it. So it was like we could sell it for super cheap, but then it would take like a month for them to get the package. They've got to manufacture it after the yeah. order. Yeah. And so, you know, it wasn't at the time it was accepted because it was kind of a big trend in the business world. Mm-hmm. And so that's where we started to learn the back end of Shopify. I started playing around in Facebook and Google ads and learning paid media. And so that started to kind of do well. We ended up selling it for $5,000 to a gal nice. in New York. Nice. And we had started our business together just like $1. We tried to go to Zion's Bank. We tried to go to Chase, but no one would open an account for us. Oh so we ended up going through America first. Okay. And they were like, yeah, you just need $1. And we're like, cool, that's us. <laughs> that's so great. then we just kind of did that. We had to put in additional to spend ads and things, but mm-hmm. it was probably 250 bucks all in. At, at, nice. Hey, that's and, a good return. You know, yes, yeah, so we sold it for 5000 And while we were doing that, I, we've started four, five, six other brands that we tried to do, and none of them worked. So while we were doing all this, I was still doing Dulo. Okay, okay. And so it was just kind of like a lot to, and Dulo kind of took the back burner. Sure. I wasn't putting energy into it. I was just manually having to take out a few orders here and there every day. Yeah. I was warehousing the inventory in my house and it was just, it took up our whole garage. And so I was like, all right. Him and I had found another business that was working, which is Simple Ventures, and we were brokering business from my dad in Wasatch. And so that actually started to churn some decent cash, and I was like, all right, I got to just yeah, you, focus on what's working and give okay. up on the other. Yeah. So I actually got connected to a guy who his sister was in our neighborhood, and he was super passionate about Dulo, and so mm. I essentially just gifted everything to him. Mm. And he didn't pay me anything, and I was yeah. like, look, just pay me back over time. And nothing ever came of it. I haven't really heard much. <laughs> <Okay>. So <laughs> he got all the inventory and it was, I think I eventually broke even after doing the Kickstarters and the inventory that I was you yeah. know, cash tied in. And so got that's it. essentially what happened to Dulo is it fizzled out and there you go. I don't think anything's being done with it okay. now. <laughs> okay. Got it. Well, there's a couple of things. So one, you mentioned starting, you know, I mean, from, from co- from high school and then going into college and notion and Dulo and starting these companies and trying and trying and trying. Mm. What, what was it that kept you going? I mean, after failing so many times and, and why not just throw in the can and go good at nine to five, play it safe. Yeah, that was definitely where it was failing. Um, you know, I had interacted with a few kids at BYU that on their first try found success. Mm. And it was really frustrating because it was like, what am I doing wrong Yeah, where these guys are finding that success? And so I think after each failure, right, you come to the realization like this is just not going to work and you have to just swallow your pride and move on from it. And so it was notion struggled. And then it took me a little bit to kind of just let it go. And then I think six months later is when I did Dulo. Mm-hmm. And so I had my mourning period, if you will. Yeah. <laughs> and as I got into each one, it's like the excitement of something new and fresh. And it's like, this one's going to work. This is going to be it. And then as you get into the grind, it's like, shoot, this sucks. Mm. And so as that one failed and Ryan and I started doing a bunch of things, there was one brand put tons of energy in it, put tons of money into it, did all this build up, and acquired tons of emails for when we'd launched the brand and we launched the brand and not one thing sold. Wow. And I can remember like that day was probably one of the lower points of my business life. And just like, I don't think I'm set up for this entrepreneur gig. And I can still remember like Ryan and I were texting quite a bit. Yeah. And 
I just was so mad. I wasn't even responding to him. And he sent me the, the meme of Forrest Gump, like waving hi, you know, the one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, I, yeah. I, I don't know. I just remember that so vividly. I looked at it in my bathroom and I was just like rock bottom of, yeah. Maybe I'm just going to be doing sales for the rest of my life. And it was just the pride of me. I didn't want to take over my dad's business. And that was like, everyone was saying, why don't you just take over your dad's business? It's already built. It's successful. Like yeah. you're the heir to the throne, whatever. Sure. Sure. But then I think it was serendipitous. My dad actually sold the business to Newskin, And so while Ryan and I were working at Case Pack, he sold it to them, which essentially cut that off to where I don't yeah. even have that as an option anymore. Got it. And so from there, you know, seeing my dad interact and at the time had the nine to five was making good money as a sales guy. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, most people would have just been content with that income, but it just didn't excite me. Like every day waking up, I didn't feel fulfilled Yeah, and I wasn't jazzed to go sell some bottles and caps. You know what I mean? (laughs) Well, yeah. And especially if your dad sold the business, right. Cause then it's, it's, it's still kind of his, right. But it's no longer like I'm going to work for, for kind of a family thing. It's more like, Hey, this kind of, it kind of became truly a job at yeah. that point, right? Oh yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. And we had talked about like, yeah, if I take this over, it has great cash flow. Could we just then use the cash to just like form an incubator and we could mm-hmm. use that to launch things. Yeah. Um, and my dad was interested in that cause he's an operations guy. Mm-hmm. So was his brother, but you know, I had gone to school for marketing and Ryan and I were kind of dabbling in that space. And so we had pitched that idea and they're excited about it, but then he eventually just had an offer they couldn't refuse. And sure. so looking back, it was obviously meant to be in that yeah. it set us up to like, all right, let's figure out what's going to work for us. That's great. And trying all these things, especially at a young age, I feel like you probably got some sort of target on your back in terms of like, and, and maybe not, but I feel like maybe friends or peer groups or even family that are like, Hey, you know, Mitch is trying to do all these things. Why is he doing this? Like, how, did you see that at all? And how did, how did you like combat that or, or push through those negative vibes? Yeah, any? it definitely got to the point, you know, the classic entrepreneur where it's just, they're always doing the next thing mm-hmm. and they never find success. And mm-hmm. it's just like, uh, when oh, you yeah. hear the, you know, someone say, I'm an entrepreneur. It's like, oh, well, you're, you don't have a job. Yeah, right? <laughs> sure. I really felt like that's what it came to. Mm-hmm. And my wife is like crazy supportive, but it got to the point where I was like, okay, hey, this is the next thing. This is the next thing. And you could just see her rolling her eyes like, okay, whatever. Yeah. yeah. And so it was tough in that you kind of felt like you were becoming that person. And the issue for us was an execution. You know, you hear a lot of people that say, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z, and they just never do it. They just Mm -hmm. talk about it. Like Mm -hmm. we were doing it, taking the leap because it can take a toll on your pride and Mm -hmm. you mentally and emotionally to have that many failures. And yeah, we were young, but I would say like the velocity of output, you know, the analogy that we use is we were just throwing darts at the board Mm -hmm. and eventually we felt like one would stick. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, there was that, you know, my dad, he was, my dad's a lot more conservative than I am. Mm-hmm. Uh, his twin is the risk taker, which is okay. why he started the businesses Got and my it. dad came in. But that's like a strength of my dad. It's, it's He's super conservative. He sees all angles and he's the devil's advocate. So I'd bring him all these ideas and he'd be like, well, you know, X, Y, and Z is why this could be ch- tough. And this is the realities. And mm-hmm. so that was helpful to have on the back end. But then, you know, I feel like it's just wired and we just kept going and trying. Cause at the end of the day, we wanted to own our own businesses. And we wanted to own brands. Like we had this brokering business that was actually doing really well, Mm -hmm. but for Ryan and I, it just wasn't the passion. And we, we both feel like there's a super important thing with whatever you do in your career is being passionate about because you end up doing that more than anything else in your life. Right. Right. So if you're just stuck in a nine to five grind working for somebody else, that wasn't going to get you the fulfillment you needed in life. Yeah. hundred percent, man. And you touched on college and I've, I've, When we were at BYU together, I was definitely of the mindset of like, you've got to get a degree. (laughs) Like I've had a complete kind of 180 shift and there's, you know, I I still kind of go back and forth in my mind, but I was very much the mindset of like, go get a good job, go get a safe job. And that a lot of that stemmed from my, my upbringing where my dad was a news anchor Mm -hmm. and we moved to, you know, I was living in seven different States before I was 16 years old and he had lost a job or, you know, had to move or whatever. And so I had the mentality of like, I got to go to college. I got to get a good degree and get a safe job. And, mm-hmm. and you, you know, you, you kind of touched on that. And there are plenty of entrepreneurs who didn't go to college yeah. or think that it's a waste of time. But how, what, what is, now that you've gone through college, you had a dad who thought that was important. 
and you, you've been in the business world. What is your view on on going to college? You know, BYU or one of these other yeah. one of these other places. I think college does a few things. So I think if you have like a very technical specific skill set, you need to go to college, right? Accounting, finance, mm-hmm. a doctor, those types of degrees. Uh, but other than that, I think what college gives you, if you don't have a more technical skill set, is a network. Yeah, and then also a you learn how to work hard and do something that's tough. Like mm-hmm. college is hard at the end of the day. Yeah. And it, that was one of the you know conversations I had with my dad. I was like, I got to the point of BYU is really hard. Yeah. And I feel like they make it unnecessarily hard <laughs> trying to compete with the Harvards and things. And I was just like, this is kind of pointless. I'm not going to use this ever. But what he kind of went back and forth with me on is it just shows you how to do something that's challenging and tough and get through it. And so... I think college is beneficial for the network for learning how to do something tough. But what I would also say is I think a degree is a nice backstop, but I think at the end of the day, if you do decide to go to college and get a degree, make sure that that doesn't consume your time and negates you from doing real world things. Right. Sure. So right now as we're hiring, we're having to double our team. You know, I don't really look for a degree per se. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a nice thing to see, Yeah. but we so more look for the real world experience, right? So if you're going to go to BYU or UVU or any other college and you're going to go for marketing or entrepreneurship, that's great. You'll learn some good things, but on the side, you should be doing real world experience, right? Like in my degree, I had learned nothing about the back end paid media of Facebook, Google, any of that. Didn't learn how to run a Shopify. Didn't learn brand strategy. Didn't learn product development and all that stuff was just top by ourselves. Mm-hmm. And so people that can do that while going to school, I think is super beneficial. So I think that was the mistake I made was allowing school to consume my time because I was so worried about the grades and all of that stuff. And I'm sure yep. you were the same. Yep. And so that's my thoughts on college. It's not, it's not a bad thing, but I do think if you go get it, make sure you're putting time and energy into the real world stuff more than the schooling. Yeah. hundred percent. I think that that makes sense. The way yeah. I'm look, I've looked at it is, yeah, I agree. If you're going to go into a technical skill set, real estate, investment banking, finance, go get that degree, go grind it out and do all you can, but also get internships, yeah. get experiences while you're doing it. And I do think no matter what college is valuable for, yeah. for the reasons you mentioned, but for me, it was like, I needed it. I knew I wanted to be in the weeds in real estate, working in financial models and working with, you know, technical uh, concepts. And so I needed to go get that degree, right. go get some experience and then, and then ultimately do it, do it on my own. But um, I think those are some good points. Cool. So, all right, you, you, you get with Ryan, you guys are working together, take us from, kind of the formation of, of dime or, or right before that, how you guys kind of came up with the concept and, and, and grew it. Yeah. So we were doing baby close drop shipping. We tried launching brands with influencers. We tried brokering, which found some success. We tried a bunch of other drop ship businesses that failed. And so we kept spinning our wheels in this space and we kind of just looked at each other and we're like, well, now that we have experience in skincare wellness industry in the back end, like, let's try and do something in that space. Mm -hmm. So we were ideating things and we came up with this concept. Um, This was Dime Beauty. And our first model was a membership model. Mm -hmm. And the concept, uh, there's a company called Public Goods that started to own this, but they did it for a little cheaper products, just like household items. And the, th- the theory was you would pay a monthly or an annual membership. And in turn, you would get to buy the products at essentially cost. Got it. And so we thought doing this model with high end skincare would be super revolutionary. And we were mm-hmm. pretty jazzed on it. We went really hard on an Indiegogo video and launched it on Indiegogo. And I think the the money that we had put that we wanted to raise was a hundred thousand dollars Yeah, because investing in, I think we had like seven SKUs. You have to order five to 10,000 each and they're like three, five bucks a pop. Right. Got it. Yeah. A lot of inventory cash go. needed. So we set up a hundred thousand. We ended up only raising 3000 and I think 90% of that was raised by family. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so we were pretty disappointed. Uh, you know, it was a shot to the gut as yeah. we had had a few times prior and, we thought the concept was great and the target was the millennial. Mm-hmm. But what we quickly learned is they just don't have disposable income. Mm-hmm. And then those that did have disposable income, they had a really hard time grasping the model. Mm-hmm. And so it was, Hey, I pay for this. Where are my products on auto ship? So they felt it was a subscription model 
And so there was a lot of confusion there. Yeah. And then the model basically limited us in being able to market really aggressively because we didn't have much margin. Got it. So we did that for a year. We launched in September 2018 and we sputtered all of 2019. I mean, we did 50,000 in total sales in that year and it was really one, two orders a day. Ryan and I would go up after work, fill a hundred bottles. So that was yeah. one thing we did to help keep cash flow tight is we ordered packaging in like 500,000 increments from China and we would just sit on it and then we would order literally like gallon jugs of product from a freelance chemist that we found. And that allowed us to not have to order five, 10,000 units of each SKU and have yeah. hundreds of thousands of dollars tied up in inventory. So this allowed us to keep tight there. But you know, during lunch hours, we would go fill a hundred bottles after hours, we'd go fill a hundred bottles and that would give us enough inventory yeah. for a month or two. Sure. And then every day we would just take turns. We would you know, take lunch, fill our three orders, and then we would go take it to the post office after. Mm -hmm. So that was what 2019 looked like. And it was just really frustrating. We had tried a bunch of influencers, no sales at all. You know, I, we can really? still think of like so one gal was $6,000 and all the like metrics showed that it would do well. She posted and not one cell was driven. Oh my gosh. So we had a handful of those and we we're like, man, this influencer thing is a scam. People just charge for the following and they don't really drive any cells. I, so, I didn't realize that. Cause I thought, I thought as soon as you guys started using influencers, it would just like, no. but, okay. So no, that, we had a lot of failures. Wow. Yeah. So that business was only afloat because the brokering was supplying it right and okay. so we were generating some good cash with that and a lot of people my dad was like hey you should just do this full time because this is good money and mm -hmm. this other stuff's not working but kind of just goes back to our passion and like the brokering was fine but it wasn't exciting for us yeah every po we got was fun and you you kind of figure out okay what are we making on this and that was a good time mm -hmm. but that event that eventually became the machine to fuel dime. So Ryan right. and I, we bootstrapped dime. We didn't raise any money. And so the very beginning, we both put in $10,000 from personal savings, okay. which gave us 20 K and that ran out real fast. As oh, you yeah. can imagine with $6,000 influencers inventory. And so then we got to the point where we're like, all right, we need to put in another 15. So I think in that year, we both personally put in 25 each. Okay. And that was like all of our savings at the time, right? We had just came out of college. We both had oh, a yeah. kid. We were trying to live in a house, just kind of chasing the rat race, I mm -hmm. guess. And came to the end of 2019 and we were like, dude, do we just bag this? This isn't working. Mm -hmm. We had an idea for a mom baby brand and we felt like that one would be a lot better because it was less saturated and competitive than skincare for, you know, older women. Yep. And my dad gave us like, Hey, you guys are crazy trying to do a skincare brand. Really? And we had this concept and we actually pitched it to new skin. My dad was like, hey, well, they're trying to do this incubation thing. And so we brought the concept to New Skin. And fortunate for us, they actually turned it down. Mm -hmm. um, this was the, the baby thing. No, this was Dime. Oh, this was Dime. Yeah, because they were, were like trying, trying to, to expand sell. and do other things outside of the MLM model. Got it. And they were acquiring companies at the time. They had just bought my dad's company. Okay, yeah, and yeah, so yeah. But I was like, hey, we should pitch this to them because it's different from what they're doing and they want that to diversify and things. And so we brought it to them as the concept and they turned it down pretty quickly. Really? Fortunate for us. Yeah, right. I mean. And so that was kind of our last, like, is this what's going to make this work? But then we were just like, do we just switch it up? That was kind of one of the things is we just pivoted. And I think that's a huge thing a lot of people don't do is it's not all the time that like, the concept itself isn't right. It's just a few things need to be tweaked. Right. Mm -hmm. And so the thing we talk about a lot is you, you remember that image of a guy digging and mm -hmm. it's like a foot from gold yep. and he just turns around. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we felt like, you know, hindsight, that's exactly what yeah, happened. Totally. Or as if we would have gave up, you know, what we have now wouldn't have come to fruition. But yeah. the key things we changed is we recognized a massive trend for clean coming on the market. There was a lot of brands trying to do it. But the issue they had was they were going more the natural organic route. Mm. And so it was very outdated homeopathic type apothecary branding and just not sexy at all. Mm. And then the other issue was they were either very, very expensive and or the products just didn't work because 100% natural, pure, like clean stuff isn't always the best route. Sure. And so we decided to 
approach this in a way where it was clean, but it was both natural ingredients and synthetic. Because there's a lot of synthetic ingredients that you can make that are good for you mm. and vice versa. There's a lot of natural stuff that's bad for your skin. Mm. And so having been on the back end and doing the brokering, we learned that we could make really good products that were clean, but leveraging natural and synthetic ingredients. And so that was kind of the first pillar we decided to approach. The next was making the branding really sexy. Mm -hmm. So we had started with black and gold, but we were in plastic in our first model. We decided to move to glass to kind of give that more luxurious feel, right? You hold a glass versus plastic bottle and it's quite a different experience. Yep. And so then we also approached the black and gold, which we actually got a lot of pushback on oh, from really? people because most women's skincare brands were whites and pastels mm, and it. black typically was associated with men's More skincare. masculine. Yeah. But the way we kind of shifted was we added the gold touch, mm-hmm. which was a little more feminine. Yeah. And what our approach was like, all right, if I see an ad with a white or a pastel package and then I see one that's black and gold, like that one's going to stand out to me for sure. So we did that with the glass and then the final was our pricing. And so we had seen in the market, right? Having brokered for companies, they would sell a serum for a hundred, hundred fifty dollars and we knew what it cost to make the product. And they were just literally robbing. Mm -hmm. There was no reason to have to charge that much, Mm -hmm. but we didn't want to be like CVS Walmart cheap in that sub 10 range. So we're like, let's find this middle ground of 28 to 48 was kind of our bread and butter range of pricing. Yeah. And that coupled with the clean, coupled with the new luxurious vibe, like really set us apart in the market. And so we decided I had been, you know, going back, I had been exchanging with an agency that did influencer marketing for over a year and they were doing the marketing for one of our bigger competitors, Tula Skincare. And he was kind of giving us insights on like, they're crushing it. They're generating 250 K a month in revenue just from this program alone. And we were like, goo goo gaga over that. Right. Like, how's that even possible? Right. And so we, we didn't jump into that yet. Cause it was like, you got to commit $50,000 to this. Mm. And we just didn't have that at the time. Right. And so we actually uh, reached out to a gal here in Utah and she was promoting another brand we were trying on the side and it was an eyelash serum and it was like a hundred dollars. And we just said, Hey, if you want to promote this, we'll pay you commissions. Not really thinking she would do much. Yeah. And so I can still remember I was laying sod in my house. And at the time we have notifications turned on for our Shopify store. Cause every time it comes through, it's just ka and it shows uh-huh. you had an order. <laughs> yeah. So it was the thrill of like, we'd get one or two a day. Yeah. And I can still remember all of a sudden it just started going off and I was really? like, is something broken? <laughs> so I go over and him and I are texting each other like, what is going on? Yeah. And we did like $20,000 that day. Oh wow. And found out that it was this one influencer who we gave a commission offer to and we realized like maybe this influencer marketing thing does work. Mm -hmm. We just need to work with the right ones. Yeah. And so that's what kind of pushed us to like take the bait on this agency because their concept was, Hey, we know who can sell. We work with Tula. We work with, um, they had been working with care of and hello fresh. Some of these like up and coming D to C brands. Mm -hmm. And so we're like, all right, maybe this is the play. And I think at the time we had $30,000 in the bank account and he was like, you got to commit to 50,000. Yeah. But the nice thing was, is we didn't have to pay for them until after they had done all their deliverables. Okay. Nice. And so the concept was they had to post like twice. So they'd post a bigger story and then like a week or two later, they'd do a follow up. Okay. And so we we're like, all right, if this works, then, you know, we'll yeah. have the money to be able to pay sure. them. If it doesn't, then we're going to have to go deeper into <laughs> savings. And I think we'd run out of savings. Yeah. 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 So we took the risk and, you know, fortunate for us, it actually turned out. And that was kind of, this was April, 2020 when we had this first large campaign go really well. And I think that month we did like 60,000. So we had done in that one month what we had done all of the previous year. year. That's great, man. And that was in the peak of COVID. Did COVID impact you guys at all? It helped us in the positive direction, really, right? because it's e-commerce, and everyone was shopping online. online. No one was going into retail, and I think the clean angle too, for whatever reason, right? Everyone sure. was gravitating towards what's healthy, what's going to make me avoid yeah. disease, and it doesn't necessarily do that. But I think that angle also was a big deal, right? That's awesome, man. Yeah, yeah I remember getting lunch with Ryan. I think it was in. I moved to Utah in August of 2020, and it, I think that was the point where he was like, "Dude." it's actually getting real. And he was thinking about quitting his job 
at case pack and going full time. Yep. And, um, well, that's awesome, dude. Okay. So, so you're finally starting to see some success. So now, yeah, take us kind of where you guys were there to, to ultimately the sale and kind of what you guys are doing now. Yeah. So we did that 50,000. And at the time, my brother-in-law, he had been working at an advertising agency in Chicago, mm -hmm. but he had, he came back to Utah cause they closed everything down. And so he was coming to work with me, working in office and he started to see this as well. And we got to the point where we we're still doing our day job and doing all the stuff during lunch and after hours. And it was just like too much. And so we're like, Hey, let's hire like one or two people, which was terrifying. Right. It's like, yeah. is this one month just like a, yeah, an anomaly, like, an anomaly. And knows. I literally remember telling him like we matched what he was making in Chicago, but obviously it goes further here in Utah. And then he was mm -hmm. also living in my basement for free. So that was mm -hmm. kind of the deal. Nice. I was like, if we can't pay you from dime, I will literally pay you from my bank. Just yeah. so we can try and make this work. Yeah. So we came on and then my sister-in-law lost her job with the Utah jazz because the basketball, mm -hmm. you know, the NBA sure. shut down. So she came on and they were both helping us just fill orders, make product, customer service emails as we were figuring it out. Unfortunately, we never actually missed a paycheck, which was great. That's great. So then I eventually grew into like three people, four or five, and we were all working out of my dad's office mm -hmm. and it became really crowded. Mm. <laughs> Ryan and I were still doing our day jobs. And then, so we did that from April to September and we decided, all right, we got to give this a go. So we both quit case pack in September of 2020. Mm -hmm. We moved into a 4,500 square foot space, a thousand office, 3,500 of warehouse. Yep. And it was terrifying. Uh -huh. It was like 5,000 a month. Mm -hmm. And the landlord was pitching us on another unit. So it would have been 10,000. we were like, dude, I don't even know if we can make this 5,000 work. Yeah. Sure enough, we get in there, we outgrew it in two months and we nice. were just bursting at the seams, but it was a year contract. Yeah. So we were just trying to make it work. And I think at that point in that next year, we got to like 15, 18 employees. Wow. And so then we finished 2020 having done 9 million. So we wow. went from 50,000 to 9 million in one year. That's insane. So you can imagine the growth, the supply chain headaches and wow. managing people. And there was just a lot of hours put in, you know, we talk about how we're young, we're 29, but we also feel like we've put in enough time to equate to like 15 years. You know yeah, I mean? totally. And so we did that. And then that space came up and we're like, we need more space. But fortunate for us, our landlord was building another building like 30 seconds from our current space. Mm -hmm. But it was like, the bays were 8,000 square feet. So we had to commit to just one. Mm -hmm. So the concept, the conversation was one bay. And mm -hmm. then from there it was like, uh, maybe we need two. And the whole building was six bays. Mm -hmm. And we eventually got to the point where like, we want the whole building. Wow. And it was 55 or 50,000 square feet. So it was like 60,000 a month. And again, it was just <laughs> terrifying. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so we got into that and at this, during this time, we had actually been talking to an investment banker who specialized in selling skincare beauty brands. Mm. And that conversation started through a connection of Ryan's and, you know, we initiated the conversation and we told him, yeah, we've done 9 million. He's like, okay, let's talk in, you know, three, four, five years when you guys are closer to that 50, 60 range. Cause that's mm -hmm. when, you know, groups will seriously look at you. Got it. So like, okay, cool. Um, but then as things started to progress, you know, we finished 2021 just shy of 60. Wow. And so those, per, those conversations obviously escalated. Yeah. And, you know, Ryan and I, we wanted to not do a majority sell unless the price was like insane. We wanted mm -hmm. to do a minority because we knew the runway dime still had. Yep. So we initiated, initiated convos with his investment banker and it took a year and a half all the way up until we actually closed our deal. Got it. So 2021 finishes, we step into 2022 and like, we're pretty deep in conversations with groups at this point. Mm -hmm. Um, they'd gone out, presented us. And yeah. so we got into that and that part of our deals initiated in January and it took till August. And that was kind of eye opening of how long this process took Yeah, and how insane it was in terms of due diligence and yeah. draining it was both mentally and emotionally. I bet dude. All the while still trying to run our business, right? Yeah. So we had a few majority offers, um, that were good deals. Mm -hmm. A lot of them offered debt, but the group we ended up going with was a group out of New York and their offer was a minority deal, which is what we wanted mm -hmm. because we're really confident in what this next bike can look like. Mm -hmm. And their deal was also all cash because they were the largest fund size of all the, the groups. Nice. And 
it was really uh, the whole play was we didn't need money because we were profitable. And so we had the cash to continue to fuel our growth. It was mm-hmm. more of just diversifying our net worth and it yeah. was hundred percent secondary. And so that was what our approach was. We wanted to just set ourselves up and our family, you know, for generations. And yeah, but it didn't, you know, a lot of people are like, well, now you're just not going to want to grind and like put in the work to take these next bits. Was but that feedback from the investment bank? Did they, they, did they, they were really mindset? worried about that. Really? That you yeah. guys were going to check out. Yep. They're really? like, you guys can go dip to an island. So there's a lot of like things inserted on protecting them as a minority partner. And yeah. Um, you know, people like just, we kept it really, really quiet because we were worried about how people would treat us differently. Yeah. And you know, unfortunately it has happened where people do treat differently when they get a little wind of it. How, yeah. I mean, dive into that. Like, how is that, how has that been? I mean, what, what do you mean by that? Yeah, I think, you know, people like random people that I haven't heard from and ever start reaching out. Yeah, sure. And, you know, you always worry what's the motive here. Yeah. And then it's just with close people, you know, the, they just think that you should pay for everything at that point. And yeah. it's just that concept of like, well, you can, so you should. Yeah. And we'd kind of, also thought like who's gonna sift away as our close friends and family because of this and my dad had this happen to him as well yeah so we had a lot of conversations with just people treat you differently interesting uh which is really weird and it's just too bad but we both realized like you know those that were actually close to true family true friends yeah uh, will still treat us the exact same because we're not going to change like that's been our biggest thing is how do we go about this into being the same people, being humble, yep. leveraging what has happened for good and being mm-hmm. able to employ people. And, you know, we started Black Hat, as you'd mentioned, as kind of our fund and mm-hmm. we're investing in things. And the big concept there is enabling other people that want to chase a passion and supporting them in that way. Um, and then also, you know, what do we do down the road when hopefully another second bite occurs and like all the kind of good we can do that way where we don't need any money. So the work that our days can be filled with is, you know, things to support other people. And yeah, but that's great. Yeah. It's interesting how people treat you when they kind of, and that's why we try to keep it super quiet because we were nervous about that, Mm -hmm. but it was inevitable. It was going to get out. Yeah. I could imagine. Yeah. Well, that's, that's awesome, man. Congratulations on that. Thank you. I'm, I was, I mean, just seeing, obviously knowing you and Ryan from high school, being buddies then, and just seeing the growth of Dime and the success you guys had is, it, it truly has been awesome, man, and Thank inspiring. And, and I'm glad, you know, we're able to work together on a couple of things yeah. um, with Park West. And yeah. it's it's fun, dude. Um, well, how, so, I mean, you mentioned people looking at you differently, but now that you guys have had kind of, you know, a windfall, right? Partial exit on on the on the sale with dime how has having kind of that liquidity event that money changed your your outlook or the way you wake up in the morning like i mean are you still putting putting your pants on one leg at a time i mean what's what's it been like the last couple months to kind of have that like set in yeah i don't think it's set in yet really um there's not much that's changed in like my day-to-day mentality you know, yeah. we still want to go to work. We still want to grind. We still want to make it as big as possible. Like we have the goal of making dime a unicorn. There's That's not awesome. many CPG unicorns in Utah and we want to be one. That's awesome. And we like flying under the radar, right? Like not a lot of people know about dime and or what we've been doing. Yeah. Um, and that's just kind of our mentality. But in terms of, you know, you look at the numbers and you're like, this just feels surreal. Mm-hmm. You don't think like this would ever happen. Like, you know, it, I did that process where it was like in the think and grow rich where mm-hmm. you write things down and you speak it out loud and eventually you'll attain it because it's in the universe. And like, I'm a believer in that to an extent where, you know, the number, like the things I put as goals, they've come to fruition so far. Mm-hmm. And I think the mentality that you take in just every decision you're making leads to those things. Um, but going forward, it's like, what can we do in a good way, good manner with now what we've been blessed with, yeah. blessed with. Right. And so one of our big challenges we think that will come is like our kids, mm-hmm. they don't understand what's going on. I have a five-year-old, three-year-old and one-year-old, yeah. but they're never, ever going to have to worry about money. And so one yeah. of our big things that we're focusing on now is how do we still treat and raise our kids in a way where they still know how to work? They mm-hmm. still have to earn their own. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we've implemented things where they don't really get access to certain things until certain ages. And yeah. we just want to make sure we instill that working mentality in them 
and that we're always just treating everyone equal, right? One of the things my dad would always say is you should treat the CEO and the janitor the exact same way. And that's something that we're striving to do. And I think it's great having that understanding, like we're good financially. Like mm -hmm. if stuff was to go to craps and the world's to go to shambles and dime go out of business, like we're in a good spot. Yeah. But just being you know, who we are, that's just not enough. We want to keep doing and keep growing. And there's still people that are set to, you know, make certain cash on the second exit. And so that's one of our initial initiatives is like, how do we benefit these people that have been in from the beginning and mm -hmm. make sure that they're taken care of too for generations in the next few years? That's great. That's, that's really smart, man. I think you guys are playing it well with, um, with, with dime, you know, you, you now, I think you guys sold 49%. Yep. So still majority owner. Yep. What's what does the next five years look like, and kind of what's the what's the end goal with with Dime? Yeah, the next five years is just growing as quick as we can, mm -hmm. and the eventual plan is to sell it to like a strategic, like a Unilever, Procter and Gamble, or a large PE group. Got it. And at that point, we'll want to sell it all outright. Sure. So the deal we have with our group is at the max is five years okay. until we can sell. Our internal goal is more like three. Okay. Um, and so we would essentially need to 2x, 3x where we're at now to get to that point. Okay. But we've been purely online mm -hmm. and we've just launched an Ulta.com uh, oh, really? yesterday, actually. Oh, congrats. And so the goal there is we'll be on their.com and eventually try and get into stores. And so that's kind of the roadmap that nice. similar groups to ours have taken and that have had successful full exits is you have X amount on online and X mm -hmm. amount in retail. And so that's kind of our next massive domino to fall. Because where we're going to be at on online is actually lined up and going to surpass a lot of those brands. So wow. the next thing we need to really focus on is is the retail side. And with that comes hiring more experienced people, right? Like a lot of our employee base now is this was kind of their first job entry level and they've been great. They've learned a lot of things having worked with us. Yeah. But now our big project is we're hiring. We have 45 employees and we're looking to double that in the next six months. And so Holy crap, dude. that's like Ryan and I's new role yeah. is just senior HR peeps and trying yeah. to get the right team built. Yeah. You know, you hear the concept of like hiring people smarter than you. And so that's what totally. we're really trying to do is totally. get people with experience that can help take this to the next stage. Cause with our current setup and just the amount of people we have, we can't get to that next stage. Yeah. And so we got to hire for it. I've, I've heard the phrase, like when you're going to business, you should try to fire yourselves as, ma as many times as you can. <laughs> yeah. Cause initially you and Ryan were doing everything right. Yep. And then you hired and hired and hired and you're kind of firing yourself from those roles. Um, that's awesome, man. I, and I agree. You guys are now at a point where it's like, you got to hire some big boy jobs and some people who've had some, some long-term experience. Cause it's, it's legit. Yeah. Um, so how, how have you guys, your trajectory with dime? I mean, since last year, this year, I mean, are you guys still kind of tracking the way you, you're, you're wanting to go yeah. in terms of sales and everything? Yep. That's great. Yeah, so we're set to hopefully finish around 75 this year. Wow. Um, just online. And so we still haven't even really touched Amazon. Haven't, we're going on Ulta.com. We yeah. haven't really gone international. So there's just tons of channels for us to expand through. And that's, you know, as we brought on a group, the hope was they would one, help us financially. They're, obviously really good at the finance sector, mm -hmm. but then helping us hire and those people that we need, those key hires, we're looking to hire a COO. We need to bring in a head of retail, someone who's been there, done that with the Ulta Sephora's of the world. Yeah. And then, um, helping us just look a certain way for that next exit. Right. Because mm -hmm. these groups want to see numbers in a certain way. They want to see X percent of revenue in each channel. Mm -hmm. They want to see a certain team because at the end of the day, they're going to be buying dime beauty, not Mitch and Ryan. Right. So like this first deal, we would argue, you know, they invested in Mitch and Ryan and the mm -hmm. team, mm -hmm. but the next deal is, it needs to be buying dime beauty the corporation and the processes we've instilled and things yeah. like that so that we can you know, slowly step out and move on to other things. Cool, man. And you mentioned having kind of goals and visualization, some of these affirmations. So what, what would you say are some of the habits you formed over the years in terms of, yeah, whether it's like a vision board or goals mm -hmm. or annual or weekly, whatever you're doing yeah. on a daily, weekly basis, what are some of those goals and how do you think they've helped you? Yeah, I think the first was you obviously put those things down on paper and then you say them out loud. And then, you know, as cheesy as it sounds, something that Ryan and I do a lot is we'll literally just text it to each other randomly. Just put it in the universe. We see those 
visually and like this is what our goals are. That's great. And then every decision you're making is how is this helping me get to this goal? Uh, personally, you know, I every night before I get down, I look at my calendar for the next day and my wife and I will sit down. We'll do weekly planning just to kind of gauge what that's looking like for the week coming. And mm -hmm. the reason that is is because we both are planners. We like to know what to expect. Mm -hmm. And my marriage and my relationship with my wife has been pivotal in the success of the business, right? And mm -hmm. so if our relationship is in a good state, then I'm not going to be mentally there to be able to do the things I need to do with the business. And so then every day, just looking at the calendar and making sure that I'm equipped to take on what's coming. Uh, because of the mental stuff I deal with, a big thing is waking up I wake up at six and go to the gym every morning. And nice. that's been a huge deal for just the sake of being right mentally and kind of getting that first part of the day out of the way instead of getting up groggy. And so by the time I get to the office, you know, it's clear mind. It's that feeling like if I miss the gym, it's like this whole day is out of whack. Yeah. Um, so that's been a big part. And then trying to be good at this deciphering between like urgent things and things that are important, but not urgent, right? It's the classic quadrant mm -hmm. from seven, uh, habits of highly effective yeah. people yeah. and yep. trying to really focus on that. And every day, because there's, you could work all day every day because of how much, how many things there are, but it's coming to the realization, like, okay, what's urgent, what needs to be done now, what can wait mm -hmm. so that I'm not just working like crazy, like we mm -hmm. have been. We're kind of back to where we're working crazy hours again, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But the hope is as we get the team hired and things, we can get away from that and have a little more regular hours. Yeah. But I would say those are the biggest things. Um, you know, my physical health is a big deal with just my mental situations. And so making sure that's dialed in so that I can perform at work and be in the right mental state for all of that. Good. Um, unwinding is another one I've learned mm -hmm. that like, not only do we have time that's a bandwidth, but we have emotional and mental state as well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, dealing with people, running teams, running a business is insanely draining. And so oh, when the yeah. weekend comes, having, you know, Saturday, Sunday time to just like unwind, disconnect, do things that you enjoy, right? Like I'm a big football fan, watching football, basketball, yeah. getting outside, spending time with your family is huge to be able to just kind of reset for the coming week so that you're just not mentally jumbled. And yeah. you know, when you're mentally jumbled, I've learned that I'm quicker to anger, mm -hmm. at it, irrational decisions make her easier. So having yeah. that stuff buttoned up has been important. That's good, man, finding the balance. Yeah. I love that. And you mentioned kind of that quadrant. I recently read a book called The One Thing by Gary Keller. And the whole thing is like, you've got to decipher what goes in that highest priority, like most or most highest priority and not get I'm muddled down by like just a bunch of stuff that mm -hmm. you need to do stuff that's less important, but urgent. Cause I think it's so easy to have a, a list of items that you're like, I've got to do all of these things, but I only have, you know, 10, 12 hours to do them. Yeah. And you could spend all day just doing little things that aren't going to move the needle. But if you say, okay, how can I either, you know, give somebody else this responsibility and focus on the one thing that's going to add as mo the most value. And, and it sounds like you guys have done a great job doing that. I tried. Cool, dude. Well, um, just one or two other things. Black Hat. So what are you guys, what are you guys investing in right now? Kind of what's like your outlook and what are you trying to do with now that you've had, you know, a liquidity event? Yeah. Where are you trying to place that capital and what's that look like? Yeah. So we have a financial advising group out in California that's helped us kind of carve out a percentage of our total fund and what, you know, amounts go to certain investments. Like, mm -hmm. A lot of real estate, you know, as you know, we're trying to invest in real estate because our, our big play right now is just generating cash flow. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think net worth and all that stuff's great, but I think the real king is cash. And so that's totally. why we're really leaning towards generating that cash flow. Mm -hmm. So a lot of real estate direct deals like we've done with you, investing in real estate like funds, investing in uh, PE funds, actual PE deals, VC stuff. And so that's, it's kind of all over the map. We've yeah. invested in a few other CPG companies, consumer product goods okay. that we can add value. Nice. So we like have, you know, boardly calls every month and kind of share what we're seeing on our side and try and give them that information. But the real estate deals, as you know, we don't have much value there other than just the funding. And so mm -hmm. we're investing there, but our eventual goal is we want to sell out of dime and we still have a few other entities that'll be in the works, but we're a little more passive on those than we are dime. And we want to just start a fund ourselves where we can invest in things, but then potentially do our own PE firm where we can go raise money. And cause what we've realized is we've gone through this deal 
And as we've started investing in other things, like it's just exhilarating to meet with other entrepreneurs and yeah. look what they're building and kind of go through that due diligence vetting process and invest in things that are like incredible. Yeah. Uh, it's really fun to do that stuff. And we've learned that I never thought I would want to do that. Yeah. But as we've kind of gotten to this point, you know, operating a business is exhausting. And so we want to get out of operating businesses and just become a fund where we can offer value in terms of funding and then, you know, high level board of director type stuff, advisory roles. Do you guys envision raising capital from investors to place into different companies or do you just want this to be like the Ryan and Mitch fund? I think both. Both. Yeah, we've we've kind of discussed what does it look like. I think obviously how much we eventually have kind of makes sure a difference. But as we've talked with a lot of PE groups, you know, a lot of them have their own money in it, mm -hmm. but then they also go out and raise. And so yeah. I think that would be a pretty fun thing yeah. to look into just because it's not as, I mean, you can get intensive with labor and, and team, but it's yeah. not as intensive as what we're doing now. Like yes. that's been the toughest thing with our businesses is managing people. Yeah, like it's my totally. least favorite part of the job. <laughs> and so if we can I get bet, to a dude. place where it's not as many of <laughs> managing people versus yeah. more so looking at the deals and the businesses themselves and solving business problems, that's definitely more of where we want to be. I love it. Well, I'm excited to see you guys grow. Last awesome. question for you, ma'am. What, um, what advice would you give for, for somebody who's, you know, at a nine to five or has aspirations to start their own business, but has just hasn't done it or been hesitant to do it for whatever reason? Yeah. I think the first thing is just doing it. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I've talked to a lot of people who are aspiring, want to do this and that, but they just never take that leap. And that's honestly the toughest part because I think what a lot of people are worried about is failing. Yeah. But at the end of the day, like you have to get over the fact of failing because that's just inevitable, right? We still fail within dime on the daily things, decisions we make that don't end up working out. And so I think that's the very first step is just doing it. And as you do it, you'll learn along the way. I think for myself, right? Like having more people to kind of balance ideas off, finding people that have been there, done that to, show you and tell you what to do. So you don't have as many bumps and bruises is another thing that I would do more than what we did. Mm -hmm. I think it may have just been our pride of like, we can just figure this out ourselves. Yeah. Whereas if you can coordinate soundboard with other people, like you're going to inevitably not make a lot of the mistakes that others have made. And then I think it's just goes back to the darts thing, right? Like I think you need to solve a problem. That's the first and foremost. You need to figure something out that is a problem in a sector that you're familiar with. Like don't just jump into something that you have no idea about. Try and get some experience somewhere. So the industry that you maybe have your day job in, like try and realize issues there mm -hmm. and then come up with a solution to fix it. And then from there, throw darts in ways that you think will work and fail as much as you can, right? It's just learning experiences. And eventually if you're doing the right things, taking those steps, like you'll find something that hits. And once you do, then you just kind of compound on that and just double down on what is working. That's great, man. I love it. Fail quickly and, and keep trying till something sticks. Yep. Okay, man. Well, thanks for being on. It's, yeah, it's been super great. And thanks for having me. Of course, dude. Looking forward to hopefully doing it again sometime. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, man. Thanks. Okay. Yep. Thanks for listening to the Chase Hudson Show. If you liked what you heard, please leave me a review and subscribe to this podcast. Reviews really help us to find better guests and to improve the overall quality of the show. If you'd like to connect with me directly or want to learn more about investing in real estate, send me a DM on Instagram at official Chase Hudson. Again, we really appreciate you listening and we'll talk to you on the next episode.